Jerusalem, often called the Eternal City. No other place on earth speaks so clearly to questions about our own mortality. Will I just cease to exist? Uh, will I come back as a donkey in the next life? Uh, is this life connected to the next life? And Jesus faces that issue directly. The problem about life after death, it goes back to the more fundamental issue of life before death. What Jesus does is he connects the two. What Jesus said about life after death on this day of discovery. This is Jerusalem's Ben Yehuda Street. As a rule, if, if you want to see the city, the life of the city, the young people, the families, you come to Ben Yehuda. But today is the, the end of a holiday. Nobody's here. But in a few hours, at sundown, the street will fill up again with life, with young people, with families. In some ways, Ben Yehuda Street today is a little bit like Jerusalem over the centuries. People have looked at it and they could say, where's the promise? Where's the anticipation of Jerusalem? This was to be the city of Messiah, a city of resurrection, a city of life. And many people would say, and not only Jerusalem, but the scriptures of Jerusalem, of the Old Testament. And what about the scriptures of the New Testament, of followers of Christ? Where is the promise of the resurrection, of the life? Well, that's a question that we want to think about today. In fact, the people we're going to be hearing from have thought a lot about the promise, the promise of immortality, of resurrection, and of everlasting life. And they've also considered the questions, the kind of doubts that people have had. I think a lot of folks are reluctant to believe in life after death because they haven't been given any good reason that there is something beyond the grave. They've been to a lot of funerals, but they've never seen anybody sit up in the casket. And that happens in sci-fi and in cartoons. It doesn't happen in the real world. My personal doubts drove me to discover answers. And so I started reading the literature written by uh, professional scientists and scholars who were not Christian as well as Christian, even those who were Muslims, and to see where does the evidence actually point. And I was ready to go with wherever the evidence pointed because this is too, and eternity is too important a question to mess around with or to take lightly. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Human beings live with a very broad horizon and they have a sense that they are heading somewhere. Uh, just existing in time gives them that sense. They know that they're being thrust forward. Uh, they can't stay where they are. And so the question arises, where am I going? And uh, that question uh, raises the further question, who am I? What kind of thing am I? Which is really the deeper question. Am I just a physical object of some sort, a brain or a body? Uh, and their experience tells them they're not because what makes up a human life is, uh, is experience, experience of seeing, of hearing, of thinking, of feeling, willing, deciding, choosing, thinking about large issues. And they get an education and that broadens their horizon. And uh, so they uh, associate those two questions, who am I or what am I? Because where I'm going is going to depend on how you answer those questions. I am on my way somewhere. I think all of a sudden my mother flashed in front of my eyes because she's a scientist. And she has told me from the time I was a child that we grew up from pond scum. And now that she's older, she doesn't want to believe that anymore. You know, there has to be something out there. 
I think the thing that um, struck me the most was that I had no meaning to life. I realized that if the universe you know, emerged out of just blind material forces um, and life emerged you know, by cosmic accident, um, in other words, if there was no God and all we have are blind material forces, then human life really has no meaning. And that was the thing that was hardest for me when I was wrestling with, is there a God? Or, um, you know, it, uh, uh, is ev evolutionary, nat evolutionary naturalism all that really, um, is that the truth? Is that really true? And I realized that if that's true, there's no sense of meaning. There's no sense of purpose. Um, and what, what happens after you die? You know, I mean, I grew up again. I grew up with a child's faith. And it's, it's very simple. And yet, and yet you don't realize how profound it is until you give it up. And you, when you realize, I knew I would go to heaven when I died. I knew I would be with God. Well, all of a sudden, if you're not a Christian, what does happen when you die? You know, is this, you die, you rot? Is this all there is to life? And if so, what meaning is there to everything you do right now? Everything you do right now will be forgotten. Everything, everything you accomplish will be undone. You know, you, you start a school, you start a magazine, you create wonderful things. It'll all die. It'll all decay. Uh, all your relationships will, everyone you, you love will die, and they will decay. What, everything you choose that you put your life into will, is temporary. Where are the eternal things? What's going to really last? How can I make sure I'm building my life on something that will last, that will have some kind of eternal or cosmic significance? I realized that there was nothing. That was the hardest part. I realized that everything I did had no meaning if there was you know, no, no spiritual realm, um, no afterlife, nothing beyond this world. Personal questions about life beyond this life have given many reason to wonder about the intriguing things that Jesus said about life after death. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. When you read what Jesus said and taught, a couple of things become really obvious that turn out to be a little politically incorrect. For example, Jesus was not an Eastern mystical guru. He was a Torah observant Jew. He believed there was one God, and the God that he believed in was different than the creation. All right? Uh, he, he didn't believe in idolatry. He wasn't a pluralist. He said, all that came before me are thieves or robbers, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So it's important with reference to all of these questions that come up in relationship to the Christian faith or other faiths, it's important to realize that you're not just dealing with one issue, yes or no. You're dealing with a set of alternatives. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. This is Jerusalem's eastern gate, closed for centuries. It stands today as a backdrop for a Muslim cemetery. This eastern gate stands directly across from Jerusalem's Mount of Olives, where, according to the Hebrew scriptures, the Messiah will come in the last days to bring resurrection and everlasting life to the Jewish people. And all around are cemeteries, Muslim cemetery, down below Christian graves, a, a cemetery that stands in front of what is today the Church of All Nations. And then covering the slopes of the Mount of Olives are ancient and modern Jewish graves of individuals who have been buried here in hope of the resurrection of a coming Messiah. Now, do such cemeteries and hopes really make sense? Or is the, the thought and the anticipation of everlasting life 
just wishful thinking. Well, those we're, we're hearing from today have thought a lot about this, and they've concluded that it, it makes sense to believe what Jesus said about life after death. The problem about life after death it goes back to the more fundamental issue of life before death. What is it? And the real question, that's the real question. Is there life before death? And what is it? And uh, one of the reasons why people remain fascinated with these things called near-death experiences is because they give them a sort of glance, regardless of what you make of them ultimately, into the process of passing over and what it might be like. According to surveys, for example, Americans believe that near-death experiences are indications of an afterlife. They do think there's an afterlife, high percentage. In fact, surveys show that even professionals, even people with graduate degrees, even, I mean, this is a generation that for all their lack of belief in some areas, they're a re generally religious ethos, and they kind of believe in God and do good and believe in an afterlife. And, and I think near-death experiences kind of raises that, and, and they're brought face-to-face -face with things like, wow, you know, the, there could be an afterlife, or we might be confronted after death by what we did in this life, and some of those actions. And I'd say, for the person who says, I just can't get there from the kind of world I believe in, I'd say, um, do you believe in God? And most of them do. I say, do you believe in an afterlife? And most of them do. And if they don't, I'd give them some near-death evidence. I say, can you explain this? And they'll mostly say, because the near-death evidence is heavy. It, it is really good. And some of them will say, yeah, I think you got me. I mean, I, I kind of would like to believe in life after death anyway. And that's pretty good. And then I'll say, look, the kind of world that you think is demonstrated by the news, near-death experiences and so on, it says that something's going on. There's another world out there. But have you ever thought about this? The world that near-death experiences evidences, i.e. an afterlife, is the world in which Jesus was raised. In other words, a near-death experience is not the resurrection and vice versa. But if there already is an afterlife, as indicated by your private beliefs or by near-death experiences, then when I talk about resurrection, it shouldn't sound so incredible to you because you don't know about individual men rising from the dead. That just tells me Jesus is unique. But you do know about the category called afterlife, and you enjoy reading those stories when they pop up in the paper because you believe in the afterlife. I'm talking about the realm that you think doesn't exist when I talk about the resurrection, but you think do exist when you read about near-death experiences. So if there's an afterlife, welcome to the world of resurrection. Jesus spoke a lot about resurrection and what's at stake in the life to come. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life, that I should raise them at the last day. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to judgment. Now these things are promised by Jesus Christ, but why believe Him? We have a lot of admiration for Jesus, but when it comes to things like this, why should we believe Him? How would He know? Well, He didn't leave us without a reason to think that He knew what He was talking about because He presented evidence through His own resurrection from the dead that there is life after death for those who believe. And this life he described as better than this life, something to be hoped for. So we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we see uh, a tomb and uh, a heavy uh, stone that was rolled in front of that tomb. We see Roman guards. We see all of these people that, that, that are there kind of keeping from happening anything related to Jesus that the disciples can capitalize on, and then we have a real resurrection. We have a physical Jesus who appears to them. Now, at first we could say, well, oh yeah, but they, they just were superstitious, and so they projected a belief. Now, in fact, the Bible says they didn't believe. 
They, they specifically said there's no way that this happened until Jesus actually appears to them and actually says, you know, touch my body, as he said to his disciple Thomas. But they're stunned. They're absolutely shocked. But here he is, physically resurrected, and the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible says that he at one time appeared to more than 500 people. And many individuals along the way, the disciples on the Emmaus Road, and his apostles, and Mary, and these other people are seeing him and touching him and eating meals with the resurrected Jesus. Now, to them, that was proof. That was proof of who he was. That's proof of eternal life that you can come back from the grave. And what a great uh, confirmation of the words that Jesus had said about life after death to conquer death himself. Now the experience of people with Christ before and after his death on the cross, his resurrected life, was one that made them very certain that he continued to exist and that he was going to see to it that they did. Um, and so for the for Paul, for example, he just says in 2 Timothy 1.10 that Christ abolished death and brought uh, life and immortality to light through the gospel. He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, the gospel, which is life in the kingdom of God, in dependence on Christ, the gospel shows you what life and immortality really are. And once you understand that, you realize what he said, uh, that, well, for example, in John 8, uh, 52, I think it is, he says, those who keep my word will never see death. And again, will never experience death. Uh, so I often say to people, if you're a Christian and you're planning to die, you'll be disappointed. Those who are still here will have to deal with the leftovers, but you're out of here. Oftentimes when we talk about life after death versus this life, we want to separate the two to some degree. We want to talk about, you know, well, what really matters is eternity. I mean, after all, that's going to be a much longer time than the present life. But what Jesus does is he connects the two. And this, I think, is what some people miss. And so the way in which I am able to enjoy and experience eternity is very much related to how I am relating to God in, in the present life. This is why Jesus says, lay, when you lay up treasures for heaven, you're laying up treasures for heaven now by the way you're responding to God. And so this life of faith that we're talking about is a life you know, faith is not a one-moment decision, I flip the switch and it's done. Faith is a way of living. And in that way of living, God is honored and God is pleased. Um, and, and He responds to that and He embraces that through the context of Jesus' forgiveness on the one hand and through the context of our responding to what it is God has provided through Jesus in this enablement to walk with Him. So that makes this life connected to the life to come as opposed to being, well, I've got this life and then I've got eternity. And of course, that's one of the things that characterized the early Christians especially. They're absolutely fearless in the face of death. A few months ago, um, I found myself uh, with a, uh, the virtual equivalent of a heart attack and was in the emergency room at our local hospital. Uh, my uh, cardiologist said that I probably had had a heart attack two or three days earlier. And when the uh, specialist cardiologist came in, uh, he looked at my wife and he looked at me and said, the results are in, uh, you could die today. Uh, apparently I had waited too long and before coming into the emergency room and blood clots were forming. And if one went to my lungs, it would kill me. If one went to my brain, I would be uh, paralyzed probably from a stroke. Now, as he said that, it wasn't exactly the best bedside manner. Uh, my wife was freaked. Uh, what's going to happen? Uh, but I had the most tremendous sense of peace because for most of my life, I've addressed death, and I know what's beyond that. 
And, that, and that's what Jesus wants to offer people. That's the way that we can approach the death that we're all going to experience someday. Well, I think the removal of the fear of death can be seen in, a, in probably one of the most famous scenes in Jesus' life. It's when he's being crucified and the thief on the cross says, um, you know, uh, basically, can I be with you in paradise? And when the thief on the cross asks this question, he's thinking about in the judgment to come down the road, uh, can I be with you? And Jesus' reply would be a shocking answer. It isn't so shocking to us because we've had a couple of thousand years of theology to help us with this. But basically what he says is, today you will be with me in paradise. You aren't going to have to wait for this. This isn't waiting for some judgment down the road whenever it comes. You're going to have a sense of being with, in the presence of God once this part of the story is over, immediately. And that transition, that immediate transition, is part of the hope that you come directly into the presence of God with a sense of His presence and His fellowship, even though there are elements of what happens afterwards that you receive later down the road along with everybody else. And don't ask me exactly how that works because I don't know. All I know is on the one hand, we're told we have a sense of the presence of God as soon as we die, and yet there are things to come that come down the road that we receive from Him uh, at the final judgment. Every single person on this earth has at least one thing in common, and that's we're going to die. And so every single one of us, we face that question. What is going to happen to me? Will I just cease to exist? Uh, will I come back as a donkey in the next life? Uh, is this life connected to the next life? And Jesus faces that issue directly. Uh, in one of the, the best known uh, verses um, um, among many, many people, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. He knew that that was a pressing question that everybody addresses. And what He is doing in that is that He is telling us that when we enter into a relationship with Him, it isn't just for a time of life here, but it's going to stretch on into the future as well. And, and, and we can have a tremendous peace and confidence about what life is when we know what's beyond. Well, the hope that Jesus brings about crossing over into death, of course, is that it's not death, that it, it moves from one form of life to another form of life and existence, and in a life and existence that is in deep fellowship with God, that is directly in contact with Him in a way that even transcends what God provides for us now. It's, it's, it's another level of life, if you will. And so in one sense, death is a door through which one passes. It's a passage. It's not a time. And uh, whereas we tend to think of death either as an end or a time or, or, or something more permanent. Uh, and that's part of the hope. At least it's hopeful if you know the person you're spending eternity with and have a respect for them. I tell my class all the time that if God told me I was going to live forever with certain people, it might scare me to death. Um, but on the other hand, when you're able to live with someone who, who cares for you and loves, with, loves you and wraps his arms around you forever, that's part of the hope that is part of the Christian hope. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, to be young again, to be carefree as a child, this tombstone here in this Jewish cemetery overlooking the old city of Jerusalem reflects a, an individual, a family, who, who buried their loved one here in anticipation of a resurrection, of a coming day of Messiah. But it raises all kinds of questions for us. Is that just wishful thinking? Is it sentimentalism? Or is it, as those we've heard from today, is it rooted in, in evidence, not only of what Jesus said about the resurrection, but about what he did. Did he actually leave an empty tomb to give us reason to, to look forward to a, a real day of resurrection? 
That's the kind of question all of us are going to have to think about in a way, like the men and women we've heard from today. Support for Day of Discovery comes from the gifts of friends like you.